Well, thanks for listening to episode 134 of the Clive Barker podcast, the only podcast dedicated to Clive Barker, those inspired by him and his fan community. In this episode, we're pleasantly surprised by the Infernal Parade, and we'll talk in depth about the Thief of Always 25th Anniversary Edition. And we'll, get, we'll also get into some unplanned philosophical discussion about death. That's what Clive Barker does to you sometimes, I guess. <laughs> uh, first, Clive Barker Podcast presents Fundraiser for Blood Money Kickstarter. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so to start out with, number one, we say thank you to Scott German And Elena DeGarmo. Yeah, and Elena DeGarmo, we met at the uh, Nightbreed screening in uh, yes, 2014. In, at the Crest Westwood Theater. And before that, she was a, a big supporter uh, of the podcast as well. So it's always nice to uh, to hear back from, from the people that we, you know, we know for a long time since we started this. And Occupy Midian as well, you know. It, there's a lot of members here from that. Yeah, yeah. And Alex D. And Ian Forti. Uh, Adam. Wow, Adam, there's no there's no, no last name in this one. And yeah. he was a very big contributor. Thank yeah. you so much, Adam. Yeah. He, uh, Chris he got Boss. The, the, the t-shirt art, actually. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the, the, the hand-painted t-shirt. Yeah. That was a great prize. Uh, we also say thank you to Chris Boss. Uh, David Anderson, of course, a uh, longtime friend and supporter of the podcast. And, uh, David. Been, hey, we just had an episode with him, and we're working on uh, something else special that we're going to be doing with him as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be really cool. We also say thank you to Jason St. Pierre. Uh, Tori Sitcher. Kip Jankowski, of course, another another regular of the Clyde Barker podcast, one of our, you know, big supporters and, and listener. Thank you so much, Kip, for your contribution. Uh, Bill Eisen. Rob Reidenauer, of course, you know, our man Rob, you know, yeah. he, it's too bad he's not in the podcast anymore, but, you know, we still talk to him, and, and uh, we're, we're keeping him abreast of stuff. And, uh, yeah, thanks thanks for the uh, the support, Rob. We really appreciate it. Uh, Eddie. And John Van Tay. Connie Aguilar. Phil Warren. Uh, Michael J. Sullivan. Phil and Sarah Stokes, which is... <laughs> Really happy to see them like support us, and uh, of course they've always supported us even before we were a podcast. They were always like great, uh, great people uh, taking care of Clyde Barker's stuff, and uh, I've been emailing them for years, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be able to to get a message from them in the mail. I was writing the message to them, uh, you know, the fact that because they, they're buying a hardcover book, and I, I, I started thinking about it like, man, I'm kind of nervous that, we're, that we're, <laughs> we're sending a book to them instead of yeah. the other way around. They've been doing the memory, prophecy, and fantasy books uh, yeah. that go th- beat by beat through Clyde Barker's career and what he's done. And they also have a new website that's been out for a while called Clive Barker Archive, so check that out. Um, and they're the ones now handling the... Uh, the Imaginer books, which yeah. uh, pre-orders from number four are open, so make sure you get a copy. Paul Audino. Uh, Bradley Gartz. I think we also met him at the uh, Crest Westwood screening of Nightbreed. And another longtime uh, supporter of the Clive Barker podcast. Sure. Um, uh, I think, fam- oh, I think it was, was it me, I, I think. Follower of the, followers of the Pandorics. Yeah, so thank you, Eric Gross, uh, for your support. I mean, we fought, we uh, supported his Kickstarter once with that book, uh, that toy maker, Magnum Opus, Volume One. Uh, yeah. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So, thank you, Eric, for your contribution. Yeah. Uh, we also say thank you to Justin Albiston, uh, Demetrios Lacomentas, and I remember that name from last year. So we know that he's a repeat. Uh, he's a repeat contributor, and we thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much to everybody who keeps supporting us. Uh, people like Matthew Aaron Burns. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Henshaw. Urs Rohrer. Yeah, th- d- just a quick note on him. I've also he's also been uh, been trading um, the magic cards? cards with me. Yeah. Oh, so, fantastic. Uh, I've, yeah, I've had some email correspondence with him. Nice guy. Um, Ville Pajukowski. I'm sorry about the pronunciation of some of these names because uh, 
We may be saying them wrong. But the next one, I know exactly how to pronounce it. It's Jonathan Q. He's also been a big supporter of our podcast. I've known him for a long time, ever since like the Hellbound Web Forum. And he's done some fan films like Hellraiser Prophecy. And so, yeah. Yeah, Jonathan Q. Thank you so much for supporting us. And he was on the podcast in our first year, I believe. Yes, he was in one episode or two. Yeah. Scott Roll. Uh, ben Warren, who was with us this year to uh, last year to talk about Imagica. Daniel Elvin. Yeah, Daniel Elvin. I, I know him from the the Clyde Barker. Um, I'm sorry, the Hellraiser Hellbound Web Forum as well. Oh, so, okay. known him for as long as I've known Rob and you know other people. So, thank you, Danielle. I promise you, you will enjoy the interview book. Also, a big thank you to our. Uh, incumbent uh, sponsor, <laughs> yeah. Don Bertram. Yeah. Thank you so much for your support. It was a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. We're looking forward to another year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jeffrey Rabe. Uh, Luke Condor, thank you for your support. Uh, Lisa Regular Meyer. Hey, thanks, Lisa. You know, uh, Lisa, uh, actually, she goes by the name Liz now. Oh. So, uh, Liz is... Uh, uh, a friend of mine and a friend of my wife so thank you very much for your support Yay. and uh, yeah so I hope you will start reading more Clive Barker if you haven't <laughs> uh, Marcus Justin Williams thank you for your support and Antoinette Smith a uh, long time uh, we've known her a long time be- since before the uh, the podcast she was a regular on the on uh, ClivebarkerFans.com um, the, the forum that Rogers Fifth Dominion started. yeah Fifth Dominion yes. forum Yes, she was uh, Tsarina over there, I think. That was yeah. her name. And, so, uh, and I got to yeah. meet her at uh, Monster Mania, I believe it was. One of the awesome. conventions for, for Occupy Media. And, uh, I was going to go to a second screening of, of Nightbreed with her, but I was so tired I just had to go. I had to go and sleep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, you were traveling from Alaska. That's yeah. uh, understandable. And, and it was starting at 11 o'clock at night, and I was just beat yeah, today was the ending of our Kickstarter, and uh, wow. Yeah, it, it was an exciting day, and we can promise you it's about to become a very exciting 2017 because we're going to be bringing you a lot of episodes about stuff no one's ever heard of before. Or, if you've heard about it, it was probably just a name or a title for you for the last 20 years, so stay tuned. Yeah. Um, and, and before we get in, into the episode, we do want to talk really quick about Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Uh, it's dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Up to 50% of the proceeds of Celebrate Imagination support the program where artist Don Bertram volunteers monthly. Please join us in donating to the program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. There's a link in the show notes and on the main website at clivebarkercast.com that will take you where you need to go to get one of his prints or art books and help out this wonderful program. Any friend of Clive Barker's is a friend of ours, and we thank him for his support. All right, so now I guess without any further ado, we'll go on to the episode, uh, The Great Grey Beast February. Hey, welcome to episode 134. We're calling this one The Great Grey Beast February. And uh, as usual, it's I'm Joe, and I'm here with Ryan. Hey. So uh, we're calling it the Great Great Beast February because it's the 25th anniversary of uh, The Thief of Always. Congra- congratulations, Thief of Always. Yeah, and um, there were two, uh, two book releases this month that um, had um, – there was that one and also Infernal Parade. So Yeah, and Infernal it- Parade came out by Subterranean Press, and uh, right now on Amazon you can get it for $19.30. Wow. Wow, that's, that's a great deal. Yeah, because it's originally like 30 bucks. So let's talk about Infernal Parade first, because I think that I was pleasantly surprised by this book, and, and um, I, was, I had a memory of talking about this book at all before, but now I'm thinking we only talked about it sort of tangentially as a thing that exists. But, yeah. But I don't think, you know, are these stories, I mean, we talked about them that they exist, but I don't think we read them and really discussed them. Well, one of the things that has helped us be vague about this is that I don't think either me or you own the Infernal Parade figures. So it's 
it's kind of hard to talk about them because uh, I'd never really got into them, and I didn't have them easily accessible uh, when they came out the first time from McFarland Toys because I was living in Portugal, mm -hmm. and we had to import these things and make them expensive and all that. So yeah. I never got into the figurines except for, like, the Nika Hellraiser figurines. But So um, if anyone out there has this entire collection, hey, you know, feel free to send us some pictures and – Maybe we'll do a collector's corner and uh, and and show people what they look like and uh, what they brought in the the package, because apparently there were stories that came with this, and that's what composes the Infernal Parade book <clears throat> that came out this month from Subterranean Press. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so the the book came out. There were uh, there was a limited edition uh, for sixty dollars that had there were five hundred copies autographed. Um, I, this is the one I got. It's number 64 out of 500. Uh, then there was a, uh, trade edition for $30, which I guess now you can get for 19 on Amazon. And mm -hmm. as far as I can tell, there's no limit to the number of those. Uh, right. I mean, eventually they'll go out of print like any other book, but this is kind of nice that it's not a limited run. Well, everything in, is in limited. <laughs> yeah, everything is limited, but there's no. They didn't say it's only a thousand copies or anything. Right, right. Okay, yeah. so uh, I don't know how many there are, but uh, I'm sure there's not going to be a lot of them. Mm -hmm. If there's a thousand, that's going to be really good. So yeah, and uh, this keep that one in is, mind. this one's a little puzzling. The lettered edition is two hundred and seventy-five dollars, but there are fifty-two of them. So how do you have wow. fifty-two lettered editions? Uh, There's 26 letters right? in the alphabet, so was it A, a and then AA a or something, or capital A and lowercase a? I'm not that familiar with the sort of deluxe editions, but hmm. maybe because, you know, 52 is 26 times 2. So I'm sure yeah. there's got to be something there. A1, A, A, I don't know. So yeah. if you got one of the lettered editions, which I'm sure uh, some people might have, although I'm not sure if anybody has them yet, but let us know what this 52 copies of Letter Edition look like. Yeah. Um, the cover on this is by Bob Eggleton, and he did all he did uh, an interior picture for each of the stories as well. Um, and the cover is got cool. the Sabaticus kind of looming over this, uh, over this sort of deserted-looking um, ruin of a city, which is which a is, really uh, neat cover, and it's a wraparound cover. Right. So this city is uh, – what was it called in the – Oh gosh, Caran Carantica, right? Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and 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 the Sabaticus looks a lot bigger than the figurine from the Infernal Parade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that I think that uh, that's a cool cover, and I think it's kind of more representative of the effect that he had on that city rather than uh, yeah, than you know realistic depiction of what he you know. Because the figurine, you can see the figurine if you uh, look at, at McFarland Toys website, you'll find pictures of these, and the Sabaticus looks more like a, a horned lion mm -hmm. slash monster, and there's a little clown sticking his head into his mouth. Yeah, I imagined it the size of like a bear or a or or a lion. So you have the book. I don't have the book yet. But I, I do have a collection, a compilation of the stories that came out with the figurines that was available online. You can find these stories around blogs and stuff like that. But um, I'm going to get a copy of this one. But uh, in the meantime, because this just came out and I happen not to have a copy, I read the stories by themselves. So I can't talk about the book. I'm going to leave that to Ryan. And um, yeah, we, yeah. Can, we can talk about the stories too because I don't think we ever really uh, we ever really did justice to them. Before. Sure. I, yeah. I mean, I think that I, we we had always assumed that it was like a blurb on the back of the of the card on the toys. Yeah. Apparently, it's more like uh, the the what was the name of the other collection that came yeah, out? Yeah, uh, the Tortured Souls. Tortured Souls. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I think so. so apparently, there's stories like that. I think so too. There's no way these stories are 10, 15 pages each, and there's just no way that they would fit on the back of a box. So if if right. we ever misled anyone, you know that's that was what we understood. I, you know, sorry, <laughs> I guess. But I, I think that um, one thing I thought was really interesting is that the the sort of uh, vague uh, time period that these take place in kind mm -hmm. of reminded me a lot of um, of tortured souls. Yeah, the Primordium, Six Destinies. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like that the, these could be these places where these people are could be 
other cities, you know, near near Primordium or in the same world as Primordium. Sure, sure. I got that same vibe too when I was reading them. And these are more like fables than actual like stories. I mean, you don't have like the the world building in these stories that you have in places like Imagica or Aberat. Uh, it's a more vague like scenario. Yeah. Um, if there's any backdrop of city names, it's like the one in Sabaticus. Sabaticus story mentions Carantica as this this uh, city that's ruled by a class of priests and. Um, and and they they're the ones who control the population, and there's a, all these like vengeful, terrible gods who keep the population under a certain draconian kind of law. Like if if a kid would steal something to eat, they would just you know blindings and and executions and beheadings. Yeah, they and they stuff. would put a kid in an iron dragon. Yeah, and, and burn and, him alive. And burn them alive for there was a kid that just stole a, a fish out of a pond. Yeah, so that. These gods are very vengeful, and uh, of course the, the priests have a lot of power over the population until one judge decided to say something like, hey, you know, these things are not very very good for the population. You know, mm-hmm. we, there should be a way for us to have justice that, you know, it's it's not – it's more humane and not as draconian. And so that becomes a threat to the system, and that's when um, the priests come up with this idea to scare the population into rejecting anything that's not the gods. And and some some crazy hijinks ensue. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a brutal it's a brutal story and and, and really reminiscent of Tortured Souls. Yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, although but the Tortured main character Souls is, is one long narrative made up of the six parts, and, mm-hmm. and this is more like, you know, the movie X Men. You know that they took almost the entire movie just to introduce each of the characters. Sure. It, it reminds me of that, and so. You get you get to the end and they've you know they've introduced all the the characters of the Infernal Parade but we don't really but but there's no real story that ex, that there's no you know distinct story that says okay now this is what this is the Infernal Parade all working together and doing their thing right I guess there might have been plans for this to move towards another uh, series of toys maybe maybe that would have fleshed out the Infernal Parade a little more I think how many runs were there of toys like were this was it one or two? I forgot. I think it was – was it two? And, were, and weren't there like small ones and like really big ones? Uh-huh. I don't – I get them confused with Tortured Souls sometimes too. And I know sure. Tortured Souls had uh, Tortured Souls 2 also that didn't have any stories with them. Right, right. Uh, I was looking at uh, McFarland.com, which is the, the company that put out the toys. And I do see they have a page for Clyde Barker's Infernal Parade. So mm-hmm. you might want to check that out. Um, so w- which story opens up the book, Ryan? Because my stories, uh, as I got them from the internet, seem to be more of a compilation of of things that people uh, did when the toys came out. And I think it was arranged in uh, to have Tom Requiem first, and that's the, okay. That's the story of the of the man who's hanged, and then he's rescued by the by these. I guess they're demons, right? I mean, they tunnel up from. From underneath, it, when he gets buried alive, they tunnel up from underneath it to, to rescue him. That's a really nice touch. I really yeah. enjoyed reading that part. Yeah. I was like, okay, well, he's he, here's digging. He's yeah. like lying dead or, or half dead in his coffin, and uh, he hears digging, but it comes from below. So yeah. and, that, and it, that's and amazing. It had a hell that this was kind of this real uh, visceral, real kind of a hell that's you know literally underground right like in uh like in mr be gone sure sure and uh in in the story uh where uh tom requiem who's kind of a, like a master of ceremonies of sort of the infernal parade um he was he was charged of a crime of of murdering a woman and then he was hanged like you said and then he ends up uh being like the the the, the person who's going to uh select the members of the infernal parade yeah. and one of the persons one of the people that he's going to invite is going to be well there's there's several toys uh that came out so it was like the sabbaticus figurine which is the monster yeah. from that that story there's tom requiem who looks uh you know he has some clownish looking makeup and he's dressed in like this master of ceremonies kind of uniform uh there's um mary slaughter and uh, she she knows she she's part of like Tom Requiem's story. Mm-hmm. There's a, a family of freaks by Doctor uh, Fetter, 
That's a weird that, one. Yeah. Um, so the the freaks, the Dr. Fetters freaks, they don't really do much. They're more like an exhibit or something because especially the ones that he puts into like formaldehyde, into giant tanks of formaldehyde, I'm guessing they're just there as sort of like a – you know, a back back piece to, uh, you know, the, the Infernal Parade. And uh, you have also the Golem Elijah, which yeah. is one of the stories that I thought was my favorite story, to be honest. The I Golem thought that Elijah. Golem was a jerk. No. <laughs> hey, but, it's not his fault. It's like, you know, like, like Wishmaster. You have to be careful what you wish for. Yeah, I think that's a pretty wide interpretation of what that kid asked him to do. Right, right. Yeah. So, uh, pretty cool, pretty cool stories, I thought. Uh, but like I said, they, they lack, they lack that world building that exists in Imagica and Aberat yeah. because yeah. these were, uh, Clive Barker said when these toys came out that he had no plans to make this into a novella. And yet here we have a novella, you know, yeah. it's, they are calling it the Clive Barker Infernal Parade novella, but really it's just all these like stories were put together under a single cover and this is what we're getting. They're 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 connected, you know, and um, and in the book, uh, Mary Slaughter comes after Tom Requiem, which you know thematically makes sense because she's the person that he killed. Mm -hmm. So spoilers. Yeah, <laughs> I guess <laughs> yeah, sort of. Yeah, we'll we'll try hard not to spoil this because it's new. Um, yeah, and sort of new. I mean, there are people out there that have the toys that have read all these, and it's then they've been available online, but apparently not in the same order as the book. Very true, very true. I mean, the Infernal Parade came out originally, and let me just look at this really quick. I think it was 2004. So, um, Clive Barton, no, wait, 2001. Yes, following the novella, I'm reading from uh, Revelations right now. It says, mm -hmm. following the novella published in parts to accompany the Tortured Souls range of figures in 2001. A new Clive Barker fiction was similarly distributed as an added attraction with the Infernal Parade series. Not planned as a novella in its own right, the six pieces of text were intended more as backstory for the individual characters, jointly designed by Todd McFarlane and Clive Barker, and could be read in any order. Hmm. So, yeah, no, there were 2004. 2001 was The Tortured Souls. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. So um, it's been 13 years since they came out. Yeah. And uh, the goal of Elijah, um, that's a, that's about a kid that learned, that uh, that hates his family, and he, he 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 runs away to he finds this bonfire in an old sort of industrial district, uh, an abandoned industrial area, and uh, meets a man that teaches him to create a golem, a man with no arms. Yes, yes, that's fantastic. Like he uses his feet to uh, to to carve the golem into existence, but. Uh, but like I said, I, I don't want to spoil this story too much. But uh, it's it was really I really enjoyed that story. And it was it was a very nice story. Even though I you know you you said earlier that uh, the story was a little depressing, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it is. I mean that this seems almost like at some points that the cities or the the places where our characters live they are almost hellish in a way. Yeah. Um, particularly this story. Uh, there, takes there's, a, place. there's a lot of sort of killing of children, like it's not a big deal. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, ash everywhere, giant bonfires, which kind of makes the landscape seem a little hellish. So yeah. I don't know where this is supposed to take place. It's definitely another plane of existence, but uh, where, you know where people have a, a terrible existence. <laughs> you know, the gods are, are killing them left and right. There's monsters. There's... Uh, you know, there's religious zealots, and there's uh, a lot of sin and destruction everywhere. Yeah. So it's 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 one of those places, like you said, like Primordium. This could just take place in Primordium, and that would be the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's really similar to Primordium, Primordium except uh, oligarchy, I guess it would be. Right? It was mm -hmm. run by rich, rich, um, rich people who were um, decadent. And yes. Here we've got like this sort of intolerant uh, religious sect that are, are creating the rules based on their religious beliefs and they're, you know, had merciless and, you know, even all the, all the, all the, the crimes resulted in death pretty much. They were like the priests of the temples of Xerinx. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if I can drop a Rush reference in here. Um, so some of these stories came out not just in the toys but also in uh, Mr. October Volume 2. Yeah. Oh. An anthology in the memory of Rick Hotala. Um, so, uh, and they were finally collected as the Infernal Parade by Subterranean Press. And uh, Dr. Fe- the, the golem we talked about a little bit, Dr. Fetter's Family of Freaks is a really strange one. Um, he creates these freaks out of regular people, I guess, right? Yeah, that's that's kind of what I got out of the story. Um, and then there's a detective uh, who is hired by Dr. Fetter to, to discover who stole the freaks. Yeah. And as it turns out, you know, nobody really stole the freaks, but... Uh, you know, this detective is going to have some, you know, rude awakenings when he discovers the truth about Dr. Fetter yeah. and eventually will go on to join the uh, Infernal Parade. Yeah. And um, I felt bad for him. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's it's um, I, I thought that one was not not that much of a good story, but uh, I, I really enjoy the, the Tom Requiem one. And the uh, Mary Slaughter and the Golem Elijah. Those were yeah. good stories, I thought. Um, one of the ones that I didn't like so much was Dr. Fetter. But if you see it as a kind of a fable, which is basically what these all are, then, you know, you can forgive the what, – what's the word I'm trying to come up with? It's The story doesn't really – it could be a young adult story, you know. It's not a very sophisticated story uh, in its own right, but, but uh, you kind of see it coming. <laughs> it has a theme of, like, curiosity and investigating leads to, you know, horrible things to being torn apart and, and uh, you know, kind of a Clive Barker theme that recurs. Yeah. Well, Clive Barker once told as a, a revelatory interview to Phil and Sarah Stokes, Whereas in the Tortured Souls novella, I was also describing a location, Primordium. I'm not describing a location here, which is something that we talked about earlier. You know, like like it's a little vague. He says, I'm telling something much more like a little fable, uh, backstories which are complete and unto themselves and not connected in quite the same way. These are the stories of who these people are. It goes back to me wanting to do circuses since the first time I ever saw a circus, which was when I was five, probably. They used to bring the circus to Sefton Park in Liverpool every, I guess, summer, and it was the grand old, probably, chipper fields. And the smell of it and this kind of scary ambience to it, the clowns used to freak the hell out of me. These are all very obvious things, but there's something quite powerful about those images and ideas, and so we really try to capture some of that, and I think they've done a great job. Of the three sets, these are easily my favorites, just because they seem to jump much more from a personal dreamscape than the others do. So uh, there, you, there you have it. This is like the origin of um, of the Infernal Parade. Yeah, it, it it reminds me a little bit of Maximilian Bacchus too, because you've got uh, traveling around and collecting these circus performers. Yeah, except it's the flip side of the coin. These are like the the, the hellish, whereas yeah. Maximilian Bacchus was more like um, uh, I don't want to say angelic, but more yeah. like a. But it a, is in that vein because they're yeah a lovely fantastic troupe of you know magical performers with a a woman who speaks to to birds and uh, and they you know. and they're all pure good I think yeah yeah and in this case they're going to be entertaining fallen angels mm-hmm. and they're going to go out into the world of of men to scare them so yeah, um, yeah imagine that that's pretty cool yeah. Um, and then we've got, of course, Bethany Bled is is the story of a of, of a woman who uh, who was tricked by a nobleman into thinking that you know she was going to get married, and she she gets him back through uh, through witchcraft, and and some bad things happen, and um, don't I don't want to spoil the whole thing, but sure, but, um, yeah, it, it's um, it seemed like a story that could be in tonight again, yeah. You know, it did. Yeah, it de- that definitely. I was thinking that too when I was reading it. It's like, wow, this really feels like it, you know one of the Tonight Again stories. Yeah, because it's very. It has a lot of sensuality to it, and there's a lot of situations that kind of reflect the same erotic fantasies that he uh, collected on uh, Tonight Again. So I, I, yeah, you know, that one was a pretty good story too. I really enjoyed that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like that also. Yeah, and, and I also was fascinated by. Uh, 
torture instruments. And if you if you uh, are familiar with Bethany Bled, she's the figurine that comes with a Iron Maiden, yeah. which is that that kind of sarcophagus with spikes on the inside. And so when someone was put into that sarcophagus and they closed the door, that person had a horrible death. And yeah, uh, yeah so. And uh, yeah, and when she gets collected, I mean, I guess this is sort of a spoiler, but then people have seen the figure, so. When she gets collected for the infernal parade, they're like, "Oh, we, we, you know, bring that, bring, bring that Iron Maiden with you. That's part, that's part of your, that's part of your act." I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> can you imagine being her? I mean, she seemed kind of nonchalant about it, but I'd be like, "What?" Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's part of who she's going to be in the afterlife, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Uh, an afterlife is better than no life. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Yeah. That goes against against the. Uh, the pet cemetery line, which was sometimes dead is better. <laughs> yeah. Remember that? That yes. was cool. Yeah. Um, I recommend Infernal Parade. I think that uh, especially if you have tortured souls, this is a good companion piece to, to sit right next to it on the shelf. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i more curious about this um, than I was with Primordium. I don't have the figurines of either – I don't either. Uh, Infernal Parade or the the other one, uh, the Tortured Souls. I should work on that at some point because you know I, I I like Clyde Barker stuff and I'm a collector, but I don't know. I never really got into any sort of figurines except for those Hellraiser ones, and even those were kind of. I would get them if I found them, yeah. you know, if I found them at a store or something. I'd be like, oh, here's a pinhead. I think I'm going to get this one. And then one time, another friend of mine, he had a few that he wanted to get rid of, and he was like, hey, I'm do you want these? And I was like, uh, yeah. And he was like, oh, I'll just send them to you. There so I got least, another couple. There are only so many shelves that you can put things on. And... Yeah, and also I, I, I would open the figurines, um, yeah. the Hellraiser ones. I guess I have a couple of those I never opened because, uh, you know, eventually I thought, hey, you know, it's just better to keep them closed. I don't need to play with them anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, it's true. But, I, have, uh, I have a pinhead that's out of the box, and his little puzzle box falls out of his hand and on into the carpet constantly. Oh, yeah. That's an easy way to, to lose it, I guess. Yeah. Especially if you have pets or something. Yeah. Or kids. Which, yeah. You know. yeah. Um, but... I yeah I, I I always wanted to but I two reasons why I couldn't get them was one I was living in Portugal so it was hard for me to find them mm-hmm. two they would be costly yeah um so I would rather just save my money to buy Clive Barker books when they were coming out so um but for this one yes 19 bucks is a good price for them uh I think you get what you pay for so uh Infernal Parade it's out by Subterranean Press it's a little neat hardcover right yeah 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 um same size as as Tortured Souls yeah um, if you're a completist you might want to get this one yeah um I never got the figures either because I was I had been married a few years already when they came out and it's like hey you know Tortured Souls here's a guy hanging by his lips from a from a rack or whatever with his guts hanging out and yeah. Here's, a, here's a lady in an Iron Maiden, and you know it's kind of like it's hard but, to justify that you know, hey, putting that stuff in, you know, hey, let, let's let our company look at this stuff. Uh, sure. Although I think looking at the the figurines, I got the McFarland Toys page open in front of me. I think mm-hmm. I like them. They're more visually interesting in some ways than Tortured Souls because Tortured yeah. Souls are cool if you like Cenobites, okay? Right. If you they're, like, they're an alternate reality yeah. of Cenobites kind of thing. Whereas these, especially I'm looking at the Sabbaticus one, the figurine, I think that looks just like a Clyde Barker drawing come to life. You know, you have this little clown oh, yeah. sticking his head into the, the mouth of the Sabbaticus, and the Sabbaticus looks like Clyde Barker drew, drew it, you know? it's. Yeah. I think it's really cool. And you got the lady, the Mary Slaughter, the Swallow Swords. She's got like this... Um, structure that goes around her and you can, you know, and I, I think they look more visually interesting than the tortured souls for me. So yeah. well, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. The family of freaks. <laughs> if, if you enjoy like jars full of liquid with weird, creepy things in them, you're going to yeah. love this one. Yeah. Those poor people. Yeah. And the golem Elijah is the one that looks a little more closer to like tortured souls. Cause you got like this weird looking uh, creature with like, hooks and chains coming out of its body and it's stuck inside this kind of um, uh, rotating uh, metal cage. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, oh, I and, have and, no idea. That, that, that's not described that way in the story. 
Yeah. Him. He's just made out of mud and ash. Well, he is, um, but but the way they, they depicted him in the actual figurine is it's like I'm I'm describing him now. So mm. we'll add a link of this to the show notes for yeah. the McFarland Toys page, so you guys can check it out, and, uh, and 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 probably buy them if you find them. So next, uh, the 25th anniversary Thief of Always, um, and we have just checked the website, and they're all every every version of this is still available, and in fact, they're on sale. That's right. It used to be four hundred and twenty-five dollars. Yeah, I think originally the deluxe edition, the standard edition, was seventy dollars. Um, and for the deluxe, they only made a hundred copies, and they come with a clamshell, and they're signed and numbered, and there was only a hundred copies. So the regular edition, they have two hundred copies, um, and it was originally seventy dollars, but now. You can get the deluxe discounted to three sixty one twenty five, and you can get the regular edition down to fifty nine fifty, which nice price drop there. Yeah, I don't know how long that's going to last. There aren't very many copies of these, um, but uh, people should get them. I mean, I think Thief of Always is a special book. I think we talked about this earlier, but um, and I think this really did uh, did did it justice. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I mean the. I, I think I said all I had to say about the deluxe when I wrote my my blog review slash unboxing. It's mm-hmm. it's beautiful, and uh, it was great that they sent Rictus to my house to deliver it. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, it came out in February, which, like I said in my article, kind of adds to the immersion of it. When you start yeah. reading the first page, it's like yeah. it was the great gray beast February. And I mean, for me in Arizona, I can't really think of February as being gray. But uh, but for you in Alaska, I mean, wow! I looked at Fairbanks, yeah, and you guys are still having a lot of snow there. Oh yeah, yeah, it's definitely a gray beast. Yeah. That that first um, chapter, actually, I I got to see Clive Barker read that at a book signing for The Thief of Always um, at the Pike Place Market in Seattle, and I was so impressed with that. And later on in college. Uh, when we had to pick our own favorite book and read uh, a chapter from it, I, I picked that same exact chapter, and, and I know I didn't do as good a job reading it as Clive Barker did. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is a special book, and I love the tray case. I love the way they did the wraparound cover uh, without, the, without the printing on it so that you could appreciate the painting more. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And there's also a, a print available of the uh, original painting. That is cool. At the realclybarker.com store, which is also probably pretty limited, so go yeah. check that out. And this book, uh, oh, about half of it is the actual book, and the other half is supplemental material, which there is a ton. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially in the deluxe. The regular edition and the deluxe both have um, the following extras. So they have uh, unused art which uh, you can find some of that in the Revelations website yeah. in, the gal- in the gallery that they have there. I think I link that on my blog post about the mm-hmm. deluxe edition, so check that out. And then they had a section called Thieves Around the World, which is uh, different covers and you know color pages where you can see different covers of the Thief of Always in international editions. Again, you can also find that in the bibliography of Revelations. So... Um, and the thing that the deluxe has that the standard didn't have is a whole bunch of like facsimile pages of manuscripts, yeah. you know, first uh, chapter one, uh, first draft, and then, you know, early draft. And then you have like, um, um, screenplay first draft manuscript, because apparently, you know, Clive Barker once made a, a screenplay ad- adaptation of Thief of Always. So... Yeah. And, and and you can see all these things and like things that got scratched out, alternative intros, you know, final and last scenes of the screenplays, alternative so, covers of, uh, of the book all from all around the world. Sure, sure. There are even so, four of them from Portugal. Yeah, they are. <laughs> there are. That's on the thieves from around the world section. Yeah. Uh, 
I knew about that. I never really got it, though. I need to find find a way to get those copies because uh, they're probably the second book, second Clive Barker book that ever got translated into Portuguese there. Oh, wow. So the first one being Damnation Game. I mean, hey, maybe I should start translating a Magica and try to get someone interested in uh, publishing it. There's a lot of books in between Damnation Game and The Thief of Always. I know. I know. Well, you know, Portugal has a small market, unfortunately. So uh, we're lucky to get those as it is. Uh, the deluxe also came with a golden envelope uh, glued to the inside where you oh, could take out – Yeah, yeah the, uh, the clamshell where you could get four prints. And there are four prints of uh, page, art pages from inside the book. So uh, they're, they're not new art. They're art that you already know if you've, if you've read The Thief of Always. There's a wall with the masks and there's um, – uh, one one of the prints is about the little figurines uh, in the Noah's Ark. Oh, I think. And with the with the lobster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so oh, there's the one with the fish and the ark is coming down and. Mm-hmm. So they're they're pretty, and you can also get them uh, separately at realclybarker.com store. Yeah, yeah, and they're they're neat. Actually, I'm pulling mine out right now. So we got the fish and we with the with the ship, and we've got the lobster holding the ship. And the wall of mm-hmm. masks, and we've got the woods with Harvey standing on that uh, mound. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's the cover of the audio book that came out. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah. the ebook too, I think. Oh, excellent! Yeah, at least they say so, that in the, in the covers, the gallery of the covers. It's a wonderful book. It's it's a book that crystallizes Clyde Barker's uh, changing gears into like a, a, a more. You know, the fantastique that he always talks about instead of, like, being, you know, Clyde Barker from the books of blood and and, yeah. and, and horror and stuff and Hellraiser. This was his first attempt at making a children's book that got published because before that there was another early attempt of his to come up with a, a children's story, which would be about God decides that he wants to pack the whole of creation again and – uh I don't know a lot about this, but I do know that he was going to work with a artist, uh, a woman artist, and he was – I forgot when this was, but I think this might have been in the 80s, the late 80s. Oh, wow. Yeah. And oh, uh, you can no find – yeah, you can find more information about that in, in the Revelations website I if you, you know where gonna, to look. I thought you were going to talk about the candle in the cloud and the wood on the hill. Well, those were even earlier, right? Those were written when Clyde Barker was a teenager and yeah. a young adult. But but he, after the Books of Blood, I think he tried to do something that would be a kid's story. Oh, and Weave World was originally written as a children's story and then rewritten for adults. Yeah, there you go. See, yeah. 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 So you have the 25th anniversary edition that I don't have. So you have more in, insight into the extra material that's in there. So but I, Thief I, of Always was the first story that he wrote for kids, and then the second one was obviously Aberat. So we're um, we're we're we do this podcast, but we're also fans, and it's hard not to sort of geek out and and uh, go nuts when something like this arrives unexpectedly in in the mail. Mm-hmm. Um, really cool. I'm you know really just sort of speechless about it. But I think you mentioned um, that. We sounded biased because we got the book for free, but at the same time, it's like, well, guess what? This is called the Clive Barker Podcast because yeah. we are two Clive Barker fans, yeah. so you know it's going to be biased from the start. I mean, you know we're going to be inclined to to think that Clive Barker is one of the best artists and writers yeah. and, and, and painters that we that we know. I think uh, people would be more upset if we are like, oh boy, here comes a thief of always again. Right, right, yeah. yeah. I mean, that... We, I'm sure there's people out there who think that way, but it's like yeah. it's their right to think that way, I guess. I mean, they don't have – they're not forced to buy anything. But but sometimes I have to say you have to hand it out to quality, and the, the, yeah. this is definitely a, a beautiful quality book that if you're as much of a fan as we are and you have the disposable income, wow. Yeah. I mean this goes this goes right into the shelf. This is a conversation piece. This This book is beautiful. I mean, even people who have no idea who Clyde Barker is, if they see this book on a table, they'll be like, holy crap, what is that? I want to pick it up and look through it because it's truly beautiful. Well, and in its time, The Thief of Always was done sort of in the place of like Cabal 2 or 
you know, Everville hadn't been written yet. And, uh, and, and it's like, where did this come from? And, you know, and why people that want him to just keep writing stuff like the books of blood or, um, the great in secret show. Yeah. Things that are more game. adult in nature. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I'm one of those people. I mean, I, I, for example, Aberat is not something that I consider like one of the things that I like most about Clive Barker's work. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm sure it's, I know Clyde Barker would disagree with what I'm saying because he thinks of it as his, you know, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Um, that's that's the thing that he wants to leave as a legacy is the the the, the beautiful work of the Aberat where he not only wrote but also painted and 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 you know did all this like Blakeian almost William Blakeian like vision, uh, which. Yeah, if you know William Blake, he not only wrote poetry and books, but he also illustrated his own books yeah. uh, with his own paintings and drawings. So I think – and, and that's a, a writer that Clyde Barker has always admired. So uh, I think in his own way, he's trying to emulate William Blake, you know, Tolkien, uh, you know, books like – books that were formative for Clyde Barker growing up, like The Worm or Oberos, which was a book that really uh, – you know, he really enjoyed when he was younger – you know, fantasy books like that. And so Aberat is his, like he said in the, I think it was the Midnight Meat Train featurette. There's a featurette in one of those. It's either Book of Blood or the Midnight Meat Train. And he's painting. So he's got like this uh, featurette where he's painting in the studio and he's explaining that as a gay man, he doesn't have any kids. His paintings and his books are his kids. So that's why he's devoting so much energy into finishing Aberat 4 and 5. And yeah. It's coming. It's coming. And I think also just when The Thief of Always came out, for me, I had been a fan for only a year um, or a year and a half or something like that. I mean, it was enough time for to get, for me to buy all of the hardcovers and, and uh, read read them all. And then this book came out, and it was like a children's fable, and he illustrated it himself. And it was so different from everything else, but I loved it. I thought it was amazing. Yeah, it was kind of like the first contact that I had with his artwork, I think. Other than the covers of the Books of Blood. Sure, yeah. 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 So this was the one where I thought, wow, he really is a good artist. And uh, little did I know that he would do a lot more with Aberat, you know. Yeah, yeah, and but, I think uh, I was in high school at the time, and I, I remember trying to write my own children's books with uh, – my own drawings in them. They weren't. They weren't as good, of course. No, oh, that's cool. <laughs> I, I did that too. I tried making a comic book of my own. It was heavily influenced by uh, uh, Epic. Uh, you, you remember there was a character. I think it was called Dreadstar. Oh yeah. Yeah, Dreadstar. He had like a, a a big sword, and he had like a friend who was a cat, and he had like a wizard friend or whatever. Jeez, so that's... mine was kind of like that. I was, That's like, cool. heavily influenced by it. And then, of course, Clyde Barker came out, and I started reading his stuff, and I, it just blew me away. And, and then it's made me the man I am today. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. So cool. Uh, Infernal Parade, Subterranean Press, uh, art by Bob Eggleton, and uh, limited editions out of print. You can still get the trade edition from Amazon and Subterranean Press. Or you um, can get the lettered edition. There's more of those, too, for uh, $275. Yeah, yeah, lettered edition. Let us know if you have one. Why are there 52 of those? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not uh, I'm not familiar with deluxe editions. I mean, the, the only deluxe editions I have is, um, you know, like this one, The Thief of Always, and I guess a couple more that are signed by Clive Barker and numbered. But I'm not a – what you would say a collector there's a group in facebook it's called clive barker collecting and it's i really respect a lot of the people there because they put a lot of time and effort and money into their own collections and they do collect all of these like super limited lettered numbered clamshell editions and i wow i sometimes i feel like wow they 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 really like these books and i wonder their shelves must be amazing and, I, was, uh, I was so happy to get this one, and then I, you know, and I mentioned it, and 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 somebody on there was like, "Oh, why'd you choose to get a PC copy, a published well, you copy?" Choose it. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, well, it was a, it was a gift, you know, from yeah. Clive Barker. To me, that's more that means a lot more than a number on a page. 
with a slash next to it. Sure, sure. I'm not saying that the people in that group do that, but there's a lot of people out there who, who see lettered and deluxe and clamshell and numbered editions as kind of an investment. Yeah. Uh, more than, than, than uh, you know, I, I would consider that a lot of collectors who love like George R. R. Martin, the Game of Thrones, or, or you know, uh, uh, Wheel of Time a series, uh, oh, yeah. uh, they develop kind of an emotional connection to the books, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. uh, I'm speaking for myself. That's what I did with, for example, like Imagica. For me, it's it's my Bible in a way. You know, it's the book that I go to when I'm feeling, you know, sad or depressed. I go and read some Magica, and I feel better. <laughs> you know, oh, I feel wow. like. Oh yeah, you go and you you memorize passages from the book, you know, like, like, uh, you know, the the, the maestro, <laughs> the maestro gentle's words, like remember that everything that does evil is in pain, you know, things like that. You kind of yeah. memorize those, and you, know, you grow up reading that, and you kind of feel like, yeah, this book really kind of shaped a few things for me, and and helped me. Like Ben Warren told us on the Magica episode, you know, um, that some books kind of stay with you. Yeah. And you develop this emotional connection. But but I think some people like to see deluxe editions as kind of an investment thing. Like, oh, I I buy it now for three hundred dollars and then maybe five years from now I can sell it for four hundred and fifty or six hundred. Yeah. And okay, sure, you can do that. I mean I used to be a bookseller. I used to buy books for, you know, dollars and then sell them for dozens of dollars or hundreds of dollars. It's fun. I mean, you you buy a book at a flea market and you look up more information and you understand that if you know how to present the book in a way that's contextualized and 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 you clean the book a little bit and you say, well, this book is written by this person and this book is from, you know, 1950 something or whatever, it's like a first edition, and then people will look at that and be more attracted to it and end up buying it for for a bigger price. You know, I mean, I've, I've, in my, in my experience as uh, an amateur bookseller, I came to know a lot of people, and, you know, you wouldn't believe the stuff that people will find in, you know, you, places where they pulp books and mm-hmm. to recycle, or they get like garbage and cardboard and stuff, and they throw it into a big machine to grind it up into pulp and make more paper. And sometimes, uh... you know, you wouldn't believe the the old unique. Uh, books that they can end up in a place like that. You know, someone cleaned up an attic and it's like, all right, grandpa's stuff goes in the garbage. And you have no idea how much money you could make out of some of those things. It's just sad. But, um, but yeah, so really happy that I have this edition. I, I think if you have the money and you want a book that, that you can enjoy and look at and enjoy the pride of ownership, this is definitely one of those. I think sometimes that someday I'm going to be dead and Joey may be selling off all my books. Um, I well, suppose that's so. fine, too. Yeah. I mean, but that's I, fine, too, so because you're going to be person, dead. The personalizing on them, you know, reduces their value for that. But uh, but for right now, I, I, you know, they all have memories associated with them for the most part. Uh, a lot, you know, most all of them. I went to a book signing in person uh, to get them autographed. And I don't know. It's just... It's your thing. Yeah. It's it's your collection, and yeah. uh, nobody else can tell you what to do with your collection except you. Yeah. And once you're gone, then you're gone. I mean, that's not going to be something. Nobody takes anything with us. We're not going to be the pharaohs of Egypt, yeah. taking a bunch of like slaves along with us and and jewelry and and stuff. Not I, that they did anyway. But. <laughs> I've been having to explain uh, death to Joey. Okay. Just recently, because my my grandmother, his great grandmother, just died uh, yesterday. That's and, very sad. Yeah, Valentine's Day as we're recording this, and and um, but anyway, uh, actually, I've been thinking about um, I've been thinking about reading The Thief of Always to him, and then making kind of a blog post uh, or like a blog series about uh, my experience reading The Thief of Always to him and his reaction and stuff. That would be wonderful. We weren't kids when this book came out, you know? We weren't necessarily the target audience. I mean, I think we were a part of the target audience. But, uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of like to see that, you know, see him experience it for the first time and kind of record my thoughts on it. That would be wonderful. I, I'm looking forward to um, to seeing you do that. Um, and that would make a, an excellent blog post, I guess.
Yeah, I think it'll be it'll be interesting. It'll be fun it, unless he doesn't like it and wants to stop. Then you know, then it'll <laughs> then it'll become nothing. Sometimes you know you have you have to be in a certain frame of mind to uh, enjoy a story. And I like to do something which is I, I play music. I like to make like a little playlist when I'm going to read a book, and I like to put it on and kind of serve as kind of a backdrop and like a soundtrack to the book. Oh, wow. I think I've done that a few times, and I, I might have mentioned it in uh, in the podcast. I did something like that for, like, Scarlet Gospels, and I did something like that for other books. And, um, yeah, I think you can you can work on your own experience reading a book, but you can't expect that feeling, you know, that sometimes you, the feeling that you get when you're reading a book that you want to read, it's not the same as when you're being read a oh, book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, mean you, it's you, not you, your discovery. It's someone else showing it to you. Sometimes yeah. that could be that could in, have a different uh, reaction. We're, we're in all these fan groups and you always see parents are like, oh, I can't wait for my kid to see Star Wars for the first time. You know, and people are like, yep, you're doing parenting right. Or mm -hmm. I can't wait for my kid to see Godzilla for the first time. And they're like, oh, this parent knows what's what, you know, what to do or whatever. And it's like you. Yeah, I mean, you can try that stuff, but you don't know that, you know, they're their own person. They're not like a little version of you. And right, you, you right. You don't know that that's, that's really going to speak to them or that that's going to be something that they're interested in. Like, I know that You can make it available to them like yeah. you've done. You, you have like your own Aberat books and you have put aside some Aberat books for Joey when yeah. he grows up a little more. They're personalized and that's great. to him from Clive Barker even, which, you know, yeah. I, mean, I was really excited about that both before he was born and like, you know, when he was a baby and stuff. But I'm, you know, I'm prepared. To the boy in the, the wings. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm prepared for the day that he... I start reading them to him, and he doesn't like them. I mean, and I know he really loves cats, and what's going to happen when uh, when Clue Cat gets scalded by the the hot water on the stove and and uh, dies, right? I mean, that's, oh yeah, that's, that's right. pretty horrible. Yeah. We we just had a cat die, and and he was really, he's pretty pretty upset about it. Yeah, he was in our uh, last year's uh, Kickstarter video, Bosco. Oh, yeah, Bosco, yeah. And here's a shout out to Bosco at the <laughs> yeah. Rainbow Bridge. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh, man, yeah, death. That, that we could do a whole episode on that, uh, you know. But uh, yeah, especially in Clyde Barker's stories. I mean, yeah. we death is is a death is both something that exists in Clyde Barker as an irreversible state and sometimes an almost irrelevant state. Like yeah. when when you have, for example, um, Everville, where there's there's a guy who dies, but his spirit keeps going all through the book until he yeah. comes back. You know, and, and, and sometimes it depends, I guess, on what Clive is trying to say. Um, I, I see I sort of see this war inside of Clive Barker. There's the one side that wants to believe in the, you know, in the everlasting spirit and and, uh, and another side that's like he, he's got bad guys that always want to remind you that there's nothing after you die and only the grave and, and the cold and the dark. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, like Mamoulian and, and, yeah. and Nix. And they sort of personify this battle between, you know, wanting to believe in, in, in living on after you die, however that is, even if it's just through creating works or your children or whatever, or, or, in, or, or you actually having a spirit that's, you know, that goes out into the universe um, versus this, you know, impending fear that what if when you die, you just stay in your grave, you know, like the Black Sabbath song, or you're just, you know, you're, you're black, you're, you just go into nothingness. It's like falling asleep forever it's interesting because it's been five years since clive barker uh fell into a coma due to toxic shock mm -hmm. which was around around january of 2012 and then on february of 2012 i remember him saying you know hey it's clive here i've been in the hospital and you know doctors thought i was going to die and i was pulling the tubes out of my mouth when i was in the coma for two weeks and i just realized that uh uh, I had it on my memories here that uh, Clyde Barker on Twitter, and this was posted February 13, 2012. Clyde Barker said, it's the middle of the night, which seems to be the perfect time to tell you about the mother of all nightmares that came to haunt me when I returned home after 11 days in the ICU at Cedars-Sinai. I dreamed I was in the street outside my house up in the hills. 
There, I met a strange group of mourners, perhaps 30 of them. They were all wearing amorphous robes which flowed together so that they looked like a vast black sail, which swelled obscenely when the Santa Anas gusted. I got to get close to them, and to my horror, they had several photographs of my corpse being prepared for viewing. Having assisted at two embalming, I knew the procedures all too well. Watching them carried out on my own body was horrible beyond words. Unfortunately, the nightmare was on a loop, which went on for 19 delirious hours. Oh. Only, when, only when I began to recognize my loved ones did the nightmare lose its venomous grip on me. Not a pleasant experience. Well, my friends, I must go to bed. I'll talk to you soon. I'm getting stronger every day, by the way. So I feel very grateful for the love that bolstered my spirits when I felt glum. Thank you, and my love to you all, Clive. So that was amazing. I mean, when, when I read this, and when you see the, the journey that's been going on for the last five years with Clive, and, you know, with, with the people at Seraphin who have helped him, and the work that he's continued to do over over the years and all the books that came out and all the stuff that's been coming out in the last five years, yeah. it feels really good, you know, that Clive is, like, climbing out of this uh, steadily. That, uh, <laughs> that seems like a good place to, to end it. That's really good. Yeah. So we, we started talking about fantasy and children's stories, and we ended up on a rather serious and somber note here. Yeah. But at the same time, it's a somber note that shows that Clive Barker – you know, rose like like a Lazarus from from uh, a situation where people thought that we might lose him, yeah. and yet here he is, five years later, still prolific, still putting out stuff, and it's wonderful to know that he's working on Aberat four and five, and like I said, we have stuff that's coming out that we've previewed that nobody else has seen so far, and we're in a nice position here. It's been five years for the podcast as well. And you know it's been it's been great, and uh, and now with the Kickstarter, it's going to go on for another year. So thanks to everybody. Uh, all right, well thanks guys. All right, and this podcast having no beginning will have no end. You can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the send voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, PocketCast, Google Play, and DoubleTwist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.